Hello and welcome back to the Rad High Rocks podcast. Today we are joined with Charlotte Burnett. She is an adaptive CrossFit athlete. Um, she actually came second overall in the CrossFit Open this year. And it's a, it's a cool story to hear about why and how she did. So we'll get onto that. She's a High Rocks athlete. Um, she's competed in London, Stockholm and Manchester. She's got the London Marathon coming up and something called the Red Bull 400. I'm not sure I'm going to have to ask you about that. But welcome, Charlotte. Thanks for joining us. Hi, it's not a problem at all. It's awesome to be here. Oh, no, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Um, but to begin with, for all of our listeners and for us, we wanted to kind of start um, a little bit back at the beginning um, and ask you, have you always been an adaptive athlete or is this come more recently? And also, how did you um, do sport growing up? Has it always been in your life? Yeah, definitely. So I wasn't an adaptive athlete to begin with. I grew up basically doing every single sport you could possibly imagine I was that child like dragging my parents off to every sort of sports event that you could possibly find as a child um <laughs> but <laughs> eventually settled on like cross-country athletics hockey um so they were like my primary sports growing up uh oh. and I did them for years and years and years uh and running was actually a massive part of my life and even now it's probably the thing I miss the most um yeah. I like I don't know why I think it's like that really odd sense of freedom isn't it like where you can just you just go out and not really have to think about it or plan for it um so yeah like I really really miss the running but became an adaptive athlete about six years ago seven years ago something like that um okay. where I had a brain injury so I basically fell headfirst into a pavement um, and that was kind of like the end of my mobility from that wow. point onwards. Um, so something so innocuous that I think people probably do every single day just happened to be the wrong moment for me and I just landed in a way where it caused a catastrophic brain injury. So just I think like I'm lucky accident almost like yeah, yeah you just hit hit in the wrong wrong place wrong time wrong yeah exactly like wrong place wrong time and I just happened to be super unlucky that where my injury happened to leave its mark was the I guess the primary center for motor function so yeah. losing my mobility in that sense was hard but I think when you have a brain injury you're just so grateful for what you do have and not what you don't have because obviously yeah, the brain controls so much so I think for me you know like I had to learn to talk again and eat and swallow and like all of oh, those wow. like basic human functions so I think to have what I have now, I'm actually super grateful for and don't necessarily see it as a limiting factor in my life because it could have been so much worse and I could have been left with a lot less than what I currently have. So, yeah, I'm very grateful in a sense I mean, that's, that... That's an incredible mindset to have and incredible positivity to yeah be be grateful for what you still can do and and you have you've done a lot <laughs> since it's not it's not stopped you at all how how long did that journey take Charlotte so from like because you said you had to learn to like eat again and speak again like how long was that journey was it months weeks years um years probably years, a yeah. good like two to three years to kind of regain those basic skills but then it's something that you never feel confident with again. So mm. even to this point now, I still feel like I'm learning. And like, even with my speech, like there'll be moments where it will catch me out and I really have to think about it. So I feel like it's just like that journey where you keep on learning. But they say to you, like the first two to three years are where you will see your biggest improvements and they kind of cap it. But I don't think I'm someone to ever be capped <laughs> by, a, by a figure. So um, I think for me, it's like you just keep going until there are no more improvements to be made. So, yeah, every day is a learning opportunity still. 
Yeah, for sure. And and how old were you at the time? Like what what age were you? Um, like my early twenties. Yeah, so like so, pretty tough time to to go through that. Like yeah, so like I guess a time where you should naturally feel like you're most independent and feel like you've got you know the perfect focus for how you want your life to pan out um and I think that's what I did have at that time but Mm -hmm. life has a very cruel way sometimes of untangling all of that um but I think in a way it's worked out for the best because what I have now I would not change for the world so even if I could change that like turn that clock back I wouldn't Oh, amazing absolutely and, you, and I think yeah. you've you've proved that just from like what we've seen and from what we know of you um I remember like the first time walking into the gym and seeing you in the gym and you were just smashing like really heavy weight over your head and I was like I can't even do that as a push press using my legs like what the hell that's not fair <laughs> and just just for um all our listeners can you explain so you're in a wheelchair but you have full use of your upper body is that correct yeah, well, kind of. Yeah, so yeah, maybe, I can... maybe not. Not, not <laughs> yeah. You, so, yeah. Um. So my injury, basically, I have no sensation below like my tummy button. So a lot of like my core stability or my lower core stability is not there. So a lot of like my core use comes from my upper abs and a lot from like my chest. But you wouldn't really know this by looking at me, but I actually have a slight right-sided weakness. So if you, you watch me, not <laughs> but <laughs> if you if you watch me press, you'll see that I overhead press on a slight angle because my right side will naturally follow a little bit slower than my left. Um, so it creates just some quite funny photos sometimes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically all of my movement is upper body and upper core. So. I'm kind of working with what I say is like a third of my body's capacity <laughs> rather than full capacity. Yeah, totally. yeah, absolutely. And so for your like journey getting back to um into fitness, like was it after your injury you always knew that you wanted to try and carry on your fitness journey as best you could? Like it was uh, something really important to you to try and find the best way to carry that through and did it take a little bit of time to maybe come to terms with with the change like you say with the the running and maybe some of the things that you had the realization that you wouldn't unfortunately be able to do yeah for sure um I actually went through a point post-injury of hating sport because I just Mm -hmm. felt like I had given so much and it just felt like I think at the time that the world like had a vendetta against me and everything that I had worked so hard for I suddenly lost overnight so I think I kind of built up this hatred towards sports and just feeling quite resentful like generally Mm -hmm. not just about sport but about everything but I think eventually like I came to terms with the fact that moping about and being miserable wasn't going to give me what I wanted for my life so the only way that I could kind of regain that sense of direction and sense of freedom was to actually just suck it up and get back into sport and know that it's going to be really hard and know that I'm probably going to face a whole heap of adversity. But I knew that it would get me back into the best place that I could possibly be in. So, yeah, it was really hard and I think... I struggled for a long time with finding the confidence even to step foot in a gym because I just didn't feel like I belonged anymore. And it was very much a case of I looked different from everybody. You know, it's not like you go to a gym and you see like a handful of people in a wheelchair. Like it's mm. it's quite rare that you go and you see one person. So I think for me going in the first time, I just didn't know if I belonged And I had that sense for a a long time after my accident and just every day trying to go and just trying to believe in myself that I did belong there was like utter torture. But I think you get to the point where eventually like people start noticing you and you stop being ignored and people try and learn from you. And I think that's one of the biggest things that even now I take from my sport is the fact that 
my situation isn't just teaching adaptive athletes or just showing adaptive athletes what's possible it shows basically the entirety of society what's possible Mm. and I think that's more important than anything in sport so yeah it's been a it's been a hard journey but it's one that I am really glad that I plucked up the confidence to take I think I think that's incredible because I think if you speak to anybody like most people will have gone to a gym or had a story where they've had to walk in somewhere where they feel uncomfortable for the first time um a lot of people we work with like to get them into a gym or to say it's okay and like one of the biggest things for us was to run fitness sessions like locally where we are to to encourage people in a safe space um and I think to do that over and over again like when you don't feel comfortable but then to do it again and do it again and do it again like just shows like I guess just like the strength that you have, which then probably relates straight back over into things like the racing where you, you know, it's, it's probably harder to walk in somewhere than it is to just suck it up in a race when you're hurting and like push through if you've had to go through those hard times just to get there, just to get to the start line. But then, Yeah, a hundred percent. No, no, go on, carry on, carry on. I cut you off there. No, like, I, and I think it is true, like, when I'm competing like whether or not it's in CrossFit or High Rocks or like anything else I put my mind to it's very much a case of I know that no matter how much it's going to hurt for that set piece of time it's not going to hurt halfway halfway near as much as what it's hurt me to get onto that start line Mm. so actually like often just getting there is the hardest part the actual competing is the easy part of it whereas for most people it's the other way around so I think as an adaptive athlete you kind of have that benefit I think in that often what you've gone through just to get there Mm -hmm. is so much more than anybody can often fathom that you're kind of already one step up if that makes sense yeah 100% it's almost like you like have an edge as such because the the mental resilience and strength and toughness to go through the journey that you've gone through to get to that race start line is like nothing compared to any of the other athletes competing you know like it's just you can't you can't compare the journeys and the like the thoughts in your head and your persistence and determination like is just incredible so when you rock up you're like well this is the easy bit like come on I've done all of that like I'm here now and I can just enjoy it which is like hopefully High Rocks has given you that where you do enjoy it on on the race day um but maybe we can start with CrossFit because that's originally (laughs) what you started to get into is is that right yeah exactly so like ironically I live near a CrossFit box and I had wheeled past it every day for months and months and months and I had always looked in and I was like that looks amazing like I was seeing people do stuff that I had never really seen and I think one day like I just plucked up the courage to go in and be like hi I'm really interested but this is my situation I don't know if it's possible and actually like I was met with open arms and I didn't think that would ever be the case in a sport like CrossFit. And don't get me wrong, like going back, I didn't know much about CrossFit. I just knew that it encompassed lots of different like functional movements. Um, and I think as soon as I stepped in that box and I met people and I just kind of was taken in by this community, I think it made me realise that actually there is such a big difference between a regular gym environment and a CrossFit environment. And for me, being an adaptive athlete, that CrossFit environment and that community that it has is where I actually felt at my most comfortable. You know, like, I never felt like I was being judged. And I think that's that's probably one of the best things about CrossFit is that anyone and everyone can do it. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Yeah, There is always something that you can take away from it. So I think it just kind of draws people in from all different backgrounds whereas I feel like your traditional gyms tend to have a lot of negativity associated with them so they're not necessarily always the most like welcoming spaces um so yeah CrossFit for me was definitely a big step but a a really really positive step in my life yeah and you didn't do CrossFit before you became an adaptive athlete no 
it's so no. interesting yeah literally like I'd never even heard of CrossFit I didn't know what on earth it was uh, I didn't even know that they had adaptive divisions mm. so I think when I first joined like it was very much a case of hey it's a really cool way to meet people to get fit just to have like a different community outside of like everything else I currently had um but it's given me so much and I think I will be forever grateful to CrossFit no matter what direction my sport goes in whether or not I go more CrossFit or more high rocks who knows um but I will always be super grateful to CrossFit for, for giving me what it has given me but I think fair play as well like take my hat off to for going in in the first like you know you had the courage to you put yourself in that situation and had the courage to go in and like ask about it and I think like if anyone can take something from this like it's such an inspiring story and journey you've been on but you know if, if you can go in like and and ask and and put yourself out there then anyone thinking oh should I should I go or should I not then hopefully this will give them to, the push to go into that gym or to the run club or to the community wherever it is if they're a little bit unsure hopefully it will yeah kind of encourage them to to go for it because like look what's come from it you know you've you've done amazing things in in CrossFit and are now doing amazing things in in High Rocks so like yeah fingers crossed this can help um some some other people try and put their foot in the put put themselves out there Mm. oh yeah for sure and then and then so for CrossFit how how long did you how long have you been competing in CrossFit how many opens and things you've done a few competitions as well haven't you yeah so I joined CrossFit in November of 2022 so by the time the open came round post-covid exactly (laughs) um but but by the time the open came around like I was still really new to CrossFit didn't really know the movements all that well so like I say my first open wasn't really an open because I was very much like treading water and just Mm. doing it for the fun of doing it so this year's open has actually been my first open but in between like last year and this year I've done a heap of competitions I competed at in Barcelona at Barcelona and came away with the win which was absolutely bonkers I was competing Mm. against some people in my division who have meddled at the games so no way to, yeah so to take that win was massive and I think that was in September last year and it kind of gave me that confidence that I needed to know that actually I can mix it with the best um and then not long after that I got my own coach so now I have like a very clear focus on what I need to do to get to where I need to get to and I suppose back, that back to your um what sorry quickly on your Wad Palaza before you go back was it Wad Palaza you just uh Wad Salona Wad Salona I'm like God um what was the what what do you reckon got you the the win what was in it like what kind of workouts were in it that you think got you the win there because um, I feel like CrossFit sometimes you can turn up and it just really plays to your strength yeah or, or it's it your strength so. um I mean the first workout for me was a massive a massive benefit and I actually ended up beating all of the guys in the division as well no um, what was that so like it was a like distance push and then a swim oh. now like swimming's a big strength for me like I grew up doing a lot of swimming like just to like bolster my other sports so put me in some water and I'm off Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, so there's like... got to have been something that just like you just absolutely nailed at that. Yeah. That competition. So I think I was like, as soon as that like first workout came out, I was like, as long as I can keep the guys, because like women and men went off at the same time. So I was like, if I can just keep the guys like in my eyesight, I'm gonna have something to chase on the swim. And as soon as I got into the water, I was just like picking them off one by one. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I just <laughs> think like that set me up perfectly for the rest of the competition because I Amazing. was like if I can mix it at that point and I was terrified I was like I don't belong in this space and I was just so scared um but yeah I think after that I was like wow I can actually do this and then yeah, some nice. of the other workouts that came up were like very cardio focused and you both will know that I love my conditioning pieces um 
so yeah it just like everything panned out really well for me and like there was bits and pieces that I struggled with like the heavy weight lifting because I'm very average at weightlifting. I'm definitely not one of, the, one of the strongest in my division. So yeah, I was just trying to work to my benefits, um, which just happened to come up a fair amount. Yeah, so definitely yeah. worked. So that's I mean, amazing. That's, yeah, that was incredible to get a, a, like a podium, first big podium finish against athletes like that in your first big, yeah, well, fair play. That's awesome. Sorry, I interrupted. Carry on. Carry on with your journey, your CrossFit journey. I just wanted to know what the, <laughs> what, what got you that first place. I was like, it's got to be something that you just like ninja at. Yeah, I think honestly, conditioning. It's my thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and then I think leading into this year's Open, I, I, I think I had that clear mindset of knowing that actually like I was in a really good position. Like I'd come off the back of like a few really competitive high rocks races. So I knew I was fit, but it was just whether or not I could actually put that down in the open because, you know, sometimes like the open, I guess like any competition plays your advantages or it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, the first workout of the open this year definitely did not play to my advantages. Like I'm not a fan of, heavy dumbbell snatches like they're quite a slow movement for me and they're just a little bit boring um I prefer (laughs) something that just has like a bit more variety which is why the other two workouts were better but um yeah it felt really good going into it but made a stupid mistake during my first open workout and injured myself which was not the plan um and it's not what I expected to do given how like good I felt going into the open but I suppose like that is the nature of sport isn't it you never know what's going to happen and one momentary lapse of judgment kind of changed my open plans in its entirety but we still got there which is I think the most important thing yeah you and you still completed the other two workouts didn't you yeah completed them probably not to the best of my ability at all um but I think the irony of it is is that it probably panned out better than it could have done um I think there was you know very little expectation I wasn't putting the same amount of pressure on myself to I think finish top three like I had always wanted to so I think like backing off slightly and just being a bit more careful with the movements in perhaps not sending it how I naturally would because I think normally you go into an open workout don't you and you get this big boost of adrenaline and you suddenly go so much faster than you know you're capable of actually holding for the duration yeah so I think yeah for me having to back off a little bit actually helped me and I got my first open win which is (laughs) amazing (laughs) um so like it, honestly it sounds like the most ironic situation like getting injured in week one and then being told that you can't then compete to just doing enough to qualify mm. actually ended up in three top four finishes one event win one second one fourth and then a second overall um, which is it is honestly wild and is so much more than I could have ever expected because there are some honestly truly incredible athletes in my division and I think it is probably one of the most competitive seated divisions that exists in CrossFit at the moment so yeah to be able to mix it with the best given that I'm definitely competing at a subpar level at the moment is utterly ridiculous but I think it it just shows how far I've come on in the year since doing my first open. And I think it's just like, it's a really exciting position to be in knowing that obviously CrossFit this year is very different for adaptive athletes and also for masters athletes and and, and teens as well. So it's nice to know that I'm performing well in a year where everything is changing, hopefully for the better so yeah I think it's it's a good sign of things to come when I'm back at full fitness 
And do you do you now because you keep like the word you keep saying is like oh I I didn't think I could be there oh I didn't think I could mix it with that. do you now believe that you are up there like you deserve to be like you've obviously proven it so like other people are probably thinking that about you but you're still thinking that about them do you know what I mean do you, yeah. do you believe that you deserve to be there now or is that still um, do you, have you still got stuff you want to achieve until you believe that. I don't know I don't know if I'll ever believe that I belong there because I have like massive imposter syndrome like I I don't know like there's just something where I feel like my achievements just are nowhere near good enough to put me where I where I clearly am like Mm. I feel like I've been in the sport for such a short amount of time that there's so much naivety sorry two seconds I think we just lost you for a second oh can you hear me yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Say, say that oh. again. So you, you don't think your achievements, then we lost you. Um, I yeah, I you just, yeah. I, I don't think my achievements like necessarily put me in the place that I'm clearly competing at because I just think there is, there is so much naivety. Like I'm so new to the sport still and I know that I still have so much to learn and to develop that, I don't know I think that's where that imposter syndrome comes in because I just don't feel like I'm developed enough as an athlete to be ranking where I rank and I don't that's nothing to say that I I don't work hard and I don't deserve that position because I I know how much time and effort I put into my training it's just there is so much more that I can still learn and I think until I'm at that stage where I've got years and years of training and competition experience behind me, I probably don't think I'll ever feel like I belong where I currently sit on the on the leaderboard. Um, and but I think that's exciting, a good thing. Yeah, it's an exciting journey to be on, isn't it? Because I think you do you do know that you have so much more to give still as well because like you say you have a lot more to to learn and it is still like extremely new to you so it's exciting to go on the journey and and see where it can get you absolutely yeah and and I think what's for me like no no go on sorry I was yeah I think the thing for me is like I don't ever want to get to that position where I'm like resting on my laurels like I want to know that I'm always going to have the desire to push myself harder and try and achieve more than what I think is possible so I think like having that mindset at the moment where I don't believe that I am good enough only gives me I guess that like superhuman power to keep pushing it and to keep trying to find ways to find that extra like one percent and two percent because ultimately that extra one percent is what is going to give me that win and not just give me that top three because I think the position that I'm in at the moment like I want to strive to be the best and I think I clearly shown that I'm capable of doing that it's just developing enough as an athlete to be able to be putting down performances like that consistently so no that's no that's so cool I think it's just cool like it's quite cool knowing you've got more in the tank so you're like excited to know that you can give more and then so what does this mean moving forward like the semi-finals like what's the next so you obviously you've just come second overall so what what's the next step for anyone that doesn't follow CrossFit as much so semi-finals for us are in May we don't have quarterfinals just because the pool of athletes is not necessarily big enough at the point to justify doing quarterfinals Mm -hmm. so we go straight to semi-finals which is now the top 20 so top 20 now go through to semi-finals which are held mid-may um so that will be my next like crossfit i guess like focus competition i do potentially have one a little bit before that but that's depending how my injury goes so yeah may may is semi-finals which will will again be quite a nice one just to try and put it into practice like a little bit more of what I've been working on um because hopefully there will be a bit more cardio a bit more gymnastics (laughs) there'll probably be yeah well (laughs) wouldn't that be nice (laughs) but yeah probably also a bit more weightlifting so there's definitely things I'm going to need to work on before semi-finals comes around um but again like it's 
it'd just be a really nice competition to get my teeth stuck into and hopefully finish again like in a very similar position to set me up well for the games which for us I honestly don't even know when they are because I've tried not to think that far ahead of the season yet um but I think they're like September time so there's quite a big gap between May and September for the finals as well which is nice and where is it in May where's the so semi-finals for us will be just online again um I wish I wish they were in person I wish we did like European and American and um but yeah I think for us adaptive CrossFit is still growing and obviously CrossFit handed over the reins to Wheelwood this year so there's lots of new changes and I know they have really big plans for things to get even bigger than what they currently are um so I think in the coming years there will perhaps Mm. be like in-person semi-finals which will be amazing um because I think you're always a little bit restricted with what movements you can do when they're online because obviously they have Mm. to be judged and those videos have to be watched so yeah I think it it will be a little bit different in coming years but this year I think is just hopefully it will be a really good way for wheel to kind of cement their feet um for adaptive crossfit and yeah let's see where it goes from here yeah fingers crossed it just keeps growing and growing um okay so the CrossFit background has obviously helped with the high rocks. <laughs> um, Especially all those like... conditioning sessions we were all yeah. at. <laughs> I mean, you were set up pretty well going into your first high rocks from that from the outside looking in. But when did so when did you hear about high rocks? When did you first get in touch with them? Did you because there's am I right in saying there's not an adaptive like not yet rocks at the moment yet so to do your first race did you have to jump through a lot of hoops or were there barriers up or maybe just explain a little bit to to everyone the journey yeah. to get you to the start line of your first high rocks yeah so for me like I had already heard about high rocks just being in that CrossFit environment there seems to be quite a lot of like crossover so yeah. I had already heard about it But then I also heard about it from another CrossFit athlete who is an adaptive athlete called Tyler, who had already done a high rocks before. Um, And I think that had kind of shown me that it was possible. So I just took a punt on it and I saw tickets were releasing for London. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to book it. We're going to see how it goes and let's just tread the water effectively. Yeah, find out. Why not? Yeah, um, and yeah, basically, I, I guess I hadn't really thought about High Rocks a lot um, until Gymshark started putting on some training sessions at my CrossFit box. And I just happened to be like, you know what? Like, I'm doing High Rocks. It seems like the perfect opportunity to do some more High Rocks specific training. And went to them and met Jake who you guys have spoken with and I think from there like that's where my high rocks journey really kind of took off because for the first time like I met somebody that wanted to make it happen because I think like I've been in contact with high rocks and they, they they're trying they are really trying to put adaptive divisions into place but obviously process is a, a very very slow and I think we all know that high rocks has grown exponentially fast um so I, I think sometimes like their aspirations don't necessarily match up with the speed that high rocks is moving at yeah so I think for me like meeting Jake gave me opportunity to really delve into the high rocks world without having to engage so much with high rocks yeah. Um, now don't get me wrong high rocks they do have an adaptive like handbook that has like all of the alternative workouts so we basically went off that and trained for that and I knew going into it I was like I feel good like I could do all of the movements like, I'd practice them and, and everything felt really really good but I don't think I ever could have envisioned what 
happened on my first high rocks because it went so much better than I expected it to go um I thought I'll be lucky if I finish it in like an hour and a half and I think Jake was like no we're going for a world record it's going to be amazing <laughs> <laughs> um, he's your high guy mean, for sure isn't he he, honestly, nice like, he, he is my hype guy 100 um, percent. and he was <laughs> on the course with me so like he was like steady in my chair like I've officially named him my wheel man so like he's done all <laughs> of my high rocks with me like he's always there every station that I go to he's there um so yeah I kind of went into it where I was like you know what I just want to get around it I just want to enjoy it and just show people what is possible because for me like even even in CrossFit it's my successes are very much outweighed by the fact that I do it to show to other adaptive athletes that it's possible and just to show to people like it doesn't matter what situation you're in there is so much that we can achieve and we just need to adapt it right for you to be able to take part so like for me doing high rocks was exactly for that reason like I just wanted to show to people that it was possible because I had never heard about anybody doing high rocks in a wheelchair for the entirety of the event like obviously I knew Tyler who had done the running segments in a wheelchair but had done all the other segments stood up or like in the positions that you need to be so I knew it was going to be a first and I think for me like I just had that like overwhelming sense of achievement before I'd even done it knowing that I was going to be doing something for the first time and people were then going to see what was possible um because high rocks don't shout about adaptive adaptive athletes and I think that is solely for the reason that they don't have the capacity at the moment to have adaptive divisions so it's never really been shouted about and I wanted to be that person where I did a high rocks and it went really well and then I could shout about it so other people now get involved which is very much what has happened but yeah I think for me like my first high rocks I I, honestly like it gives me shivers like thinking back to it because I ended up on the podium which I think was a whole debacle in itself because they had never expected an adaptive athlete to get onto the podium (laughs) they don't know cardio charlotte do they (laughs) yeah yeah, honestly (laughs) um so i think like they they didn't really plan for it so there was like this whole debacle after i finished you know like i finished in an hour and four minutes and 50 stomach seconds which unreal is really fast apparently but at that time I didn't know that I didn't know it's how fast. quick it was <laughs> um, but yeah like it got me on the podium in my age group and, and I think they had this sudden panic where it was like we've never had this situation before what do we yeah, do now now what yeah what do we do um so yeah like it it like it, it was a shame because it kind of tainted my experience slightly because um, they said that I wasn't allowed to podium because my adaptions weren't equivalent even though they had been adapted by high rocks so mm-hmm. there was like this very I, I don't know like it, it gone from this this element of like pure joy and just knowing that I had achieved something that I guess people didn't really think was possible to suddenly feeling like I was kind of being pushed out because I didn't fit the norm. Um, But I don't, I don't, I think looking back, I don't think it was necessarily High Rocks' fault. You know, it was something new. They clearly hadn't planned for it. I don't think anybody thought it was possible, but hopefully like it's given them like a better understanding of what needs to happen moving forwards for adaptive athletes. Um. Have and you, I just really want to push it on. Have you have you spoken to them since like since that after that event and the whole debacle with the with the podium? Did you like sit, did you have chance to sit down with them and talk since as in moving forward or have they asked you for any advice or no? Um I I I have tried to reach out to them, but I often keep getting blocked and I, I find it really frustrating because 
like I, I know that Hyrox has grown so fast that often it's really difficult to put these things into action. But like I've offered my help and I've offered to to give them all the advice that they need to make sure these adaptive divisions exist and enable adaptive athletes to take part and have the opportunity to fight for fight for world championships positions fight for podiums because at the moment we can't qualify for world championships like I have a time that more than qualifies for me for world championships I was sent the email to sign up for my place and it was then rescinded by High Rocks because I'm apparently not allowed to take part so like I, I've tried to give my advice to high rocks but it's it's often been blocked and like I have been told that they are working on adaptive divisions and I was told that they would be in place for the 24-25 season but I had a recent com- uh, conversation um, at the European Championships about this and it seems that that perhaps isn't the case it perhaps might not happen for this season so it's just I, I I think at the moment for me it's like this constant like sense of disappointment of knowing that I put all of this effort into being really competitive in high rocks like a lot of other athletes do but I just don't have the opportunity to get that recognition of the podiums or have the opportunity to compete for those world championship spots um when I think there is so much that high rocks can do you know like I get messages from people almost on a daily basis who are adaptive athletes and want to do high rocks. And it's so difficult sometimes as an adaptive athlete to want to shout about high rocks mm-hmm. when things aren't necessarily moving fast enough. But I I don't know what goes on behind the scenes. So like, it's a really difficult thing to comment on. But I, I just hope that high rocks will listen to adaptive athletes and will get adaptive divisions put in place because it's such a great landscape for adaptive athletes to take part in such a large scale you know global competition and I don't think there is honestly like any better way other than CrossFit to highlight the capabilities of adaptive athletes Mm. So I just really hope that these things move slightly faster than what they currently are, um, because I really think there would be a lot of benefit to high rocks by having adaptive athletes take part, and not just for the benefit of adaptive athletes, like this is for the benefit of everybody, because there is so much that as adaptive athletes we can give to high rocks, mm-hmm. and there's so much that high rocks can give to us. So it's. I, I think the world just needs to see it, but the world can't see it happen if high rocks don't facilitate it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely doing the right thing by like speaking about it and you know, by going to your first high rocks and putting adaptive athletes on the map and then you can shout about it. I, I totally like I'm inspired by your want to make it happen because I feel like, like you are right. Why, you know, why is it any different? Like why, why can't there be a category and why can't you qualify for the world championships? Like what's, what is the, the difference? Like you should be treated the same as everyone else is treated. Just like there's the mixed doubles category and the relay category. Like there should be the adaptive athletes category. Like it, it, and I, I probably understand from High Rock's perspective that maybe they're worried that they need to get it like right, like when they do it. But it's almost like actually, if they just start to do something, then it's all it's it's better that something's happening and that change is happening. And I guarantee they won't get it right when they they start. Like they're not going to. They they'll miss something. They'll do something wrong. Someone will complain about something. But it's it's just like the normal um or like the the other issues that have been with like the chalk at Dublin was it Dublin or something you know like that's something that I'm sure many people complained about and they didn't quite get it right first time but 
it, change then happens it's like it almost needs to just start like for yeah it to, to get better like and I, I, I think honestly I think you've hit the nail on the head because that that I think is the issue with Hyrox at the moment they want it to be perfect and they don't want to bring in adaptive divisions until it's perfect and I understand that but there also comes a point where surely it's better to just have adaptive athletes competing yeah exactly rather than kind of keep it all behind the scenes until you're happy that it's perfect because that does nothing other than push adaptive athletes back when all we want to do is be able to compete on an evil playing field as every other athlete is that does high rocks and I think you know like the biggest thing that that I want to see is just adaptive athletes being able to compete but being able to compete and be rewarded for their achievements like if they end up on a podium Mm -hmm. allow them to have that podium because they've earned it but I think from the conversations that I've had like high rocks have very much been like but your adaptions aren't the equivalents but I'm like but you've created the equivalent so if you're not happy that it's not the equivalent change it like we don't mind if you change it all we want to do is compete like we're athletes we want to compete we want to be seen and we just want to show the world what is possible and it feels like at the moment we're kind of being stopped from doing that so I just I just want it to change for everybody because yeah there is, there is so much that we can that we can give to the high rocks world and i think it's a shame that high rocks aren't seeing that at the moment i think they will it's just taking longer than we all want it to take and, and yeah, also and- i think they're lucky they're lucky that it's someone like you that's that's competed and got that podium finish because it might put somebody else off so like they've they've obviously opened it up to adaptive athletes because they allowed you to take place and race so they've started the ball rolling so you can't hold it there and then when you like compete and you succeed and you get a a podium finish you can't then backtrack like that that to me is like you've started you've start you have started something you're allowing adaptive athletes in it's incredible to see you're getting a podium finish you're pushing pushing the sport and you're pushing yourself so now we need to keep moving forward you can't then stop and like luckily you're somebody that's got some dogged determination and you you aren't put off easily which you've, you've shown already but anybody else it could have put them off high rocks and then they'd not go back which yeah then I feel like it's more detrimental than not like than not doing it in the first place and waiting and saying okay we will have a, an adaptive category in two years time um and then like wait for that and then it and it goes right but they've started it now so to, to me yeah. I'm like you've got to keep going you've got to move it forward you haven't got a choice you've you've put it in place charlotte's just come along and like kicked everyone's ass and got on the podium so now what are you going to do about it like keep moving forward it's inspiring people and people see you do it and then they want to do it and i totally get that if i was an adaptive athlete and i saw you to get that second i'd like i'd want to be there i'd be like i want to do that and it's not only inspiring adaptive athletes i think it's inspiring all athletes like agreed yeah it's incredible like you're probably smashing my ski time like <laughs> with all your tra- you know it's like it's for everyone it's an incredible thing to bring to the sport and I like it like you say if you succeed it sh- it should be recognized and um, exactly but I wanted like- to ask oh no no go for it go for it no I was gonna say like that's the reason why I keep showing up because I think the more that high rocks see me and the more that high rocks know that as an adaptive athlete, I want to be there and I want to be there, you know, repeatedly. And I want to compete at the highest level. I feel like hopefully this will kind of encourage them to move those processes that they've clearly got going on behind the scenes a little bit faster because surely the more visible that you are as an athlete, the more likely they are to make changes or this is the mindset that I'm going with at the moment at least I'm like surely if you keep seeing me you're gonna get fed (laughs) up that you're seeing me and you're gonna get fed up that I'm consistently getting on the podium so you're gonna have to do something about it so I'm like I'm trying trying to play them it 
I'm trying to play them at their own game at the moment, just so they just so they kind of get things moving a little bit faster. Because yeah, I I I want it to be like I I would honestly love it next year to have like an entire wave just for adaptive athletes to go off like for us to have our own wave like how incredible would that be like I I just think that would be incredible like it is why why shouldn't you like I do I do think yeah you're right but I I like the tactic I think yes keep like you're like (laughs) you're not getting rid of me here I'm just gonna keep turning up keep getting on that um but we touched on it a little bit before we started recording and I wanted to um just ask for anyone listening that's maybe not been to our high rocks but you did say that you felt like very included when you arrived at high rocks and the community that came with it so could you maybe just elaborate on that a little bit and how obviously you getting to a race is a bigger journey for than another athlete like even just the maybe the ramps that are set up on the access or all that sort of thing like did you find that it was uh, an easy thing for you to to get to and to be part of yeah for sure so I think like for me that was one of my biggest like concerns was like how would I get to the venues like would the venues be set up to be wheelchair friendly and it just so happens that actually the majority of venues that they use are very large convention type halls that naturally have to have accessibility requirements built into them so in terms of like actual accessibility of the events like I I cannot fault it like accessibility is great I, I think they they've kind of designed them perfectly that it works as an adaptive event without it actually being an adaptive event which I think helps them facilitate it when adaptive athletes do actually want to take part I think the only caveat to that is sometimes like the surfaces that you push on if you're in a wheelchair are not always the most conducive to being in a wheelchair and like this happened for me at Manchester like the surface wasn't great it was like quite rubbery in parts and had a few like like bumps and holes in the in the actual track which ended up catapulting me out of my wheelchair a few times which is like just one of those things that you have to accept might happen because if you're pushing at speed and often like you are pushing like the capabilities that your chair can withstand these things happen some surfaces are better than others like the the XL is significantly better than Manchester, for example. Pick, pick your but... venue. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Tried and tested. Your... <laughs> yeah, pick your venue, pick your battles. Um, but no, like generally, they are really accessibility friendly venues. But beyond that, it's the people at the events that make it what it is for me. Because I think... I. Uh, as an adaptive athlete, I have never felt so included in a competition as I did at my first High Rocks. Like going to London, I had people coming up to me before I'd even taken part that were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You're an inspiration. I can't wait to see you race. I'm going to come back tomorrow just to watch you. Mm. And it was like, those things are just incredible to hear because I'm also a bit like, if I'm hearing that, what if they're then talking to other people who then know someone with a disability and then they're you know like it's that Mm. it's that knock-on effect but on like the actual race day I will I will never forget the noise of it like they stationed me because I have have pre-arranged stations just for like um accessibility needs so just to give me a bit more room they would always station me right up at the top. So like the barriers were right next to me. That's so cool. I like, it's, it's super intimidating, but like incredible to have like all of these people just like shouting for me. And these are like people that I don't even know. And it was just like the most heartwarming experience to know that like people out there were like wanting to see me achieve great things. And it wasn't just like they were stood there watching, like they were like really involved. And it was just like the most incredible environment. And I felt like I couldn't struggle 
because I had so much support. It was kind of like being carried around the course. And it was just like, I, I don't think I would ever be able to put into words what that first high rocks felt like because it was kind of like an out of body experience. Like I, I, I genuinely did not know that it would feel the way that it felt. And I thought maybe it's just a London thing. But then I've done like three high rocks since and it's been the same at all of them. Like even in Stockholm where it was like a lot smaller, the support was still the same. And it just, I, I think that shows like how much it impacts other people mm. seeing like what I do or what other adaptive athletes do. And I just think like that speaks volumes and like that's that's why I do it like I say like it's not about my performances of course I want to do well for me but that isn't the primary reason why I do what I do like I do it to inspire other people and to engage the disabled community in fitness and to get other adaptive athletes involved in what is a global sport now because you gain so much from it and not just from like a a fitness perspective but just from like a confidence perspective like just skills like that that are often kind of ignored in like day-to-day society are really applauded in high rocks so it just like you learn so much and I this is why I'm so passionate about this because I just want everybody who is in a similar position to me or has a disability I want them to be able to experience it because there is so much that can be gained from it oh I love that like yeah I think I I was gonna ask as well you've touched on it a little bit and you've obviously learned a lot from doing high rocks but for you as an adaptive athlete do you find it a more physical or a more mental like we, we know that you have the mental toughness for from your journey already like you, you do because you've got yourself there you know which is incredible after like your injury and being able to kind of flip it and see the positive side and still try and like push the boundaries and test your body um but how do you find it in the actual race do you do you find you are testing your body and pushing it like harder than you're testing your mental strength or yeah a hundred percent I think for me like no matter what event I'm competing in it is a hundred percent physical because I think like you've just alluded to for me just getting to the competition has been such a mental battle that actually the competing is the easy side of it so that basically just takes over and it all becomes physical and I think when you've had to push yourself so much and overcome so much adversity just to get there, you're not afraid of the physical pain. So whereas like a lot of people are scared to hit that pain barrier, adaptive athletes often aren't. And that is kind of what you strive for. Like you strive to find that pain barrier and then to like push through that pain barrier. Because I I just think, I, I mean, I can't speak for all adaptive athletes, but for me, I know that if I push through that pain barrier, I'm giving it a hundred percent because I can't give anything more mentally. So as long as I'm giving a hundred percent physically, no matter what outcome there is, I've given it my all. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, like it is a hundred percent physical. Like I, I don't, I don't think for me in any of my races, I've really had a mental battle don't get me wrong like I get to the wall balls and I do have like a bit of a mental block knowing how many wall balls I've got in front of me <laughs> doesn't everyone <laughs> so you are human like she is human <laughs> um but yeah I think like at that point of the race that's more like mental fatigue for me yeah, rather than like... like the lack of mental strength to get through it it's just yeah you you definitely hit that mental fatigue barrier um at the end and I think those wall balls are an absolute killer it does not matter does not matter how much you practice them under fatigue like I can never recreate that feeling of pain in the wall balls and what I can in training and And it's it's like it should be so easy because it's at the end and you're like it's the last thing to do but it just 
I do, sometimes I think as well, your body's just like, oh, I'm nearly there. And then you feel even more tired because you know you're nearly there. I don't know. Yeah, it's, like, it's just weird oh. though because I feel like the last run is the easiest run out of all of them because I know yeah, it's the last agreed. one. Yeah, agreed. that's true. But the, but the last actual like workout is the oh. hardest workout of all of them. Like it just, it absolutely You're so close, wipes but so far. <laughs> and then it's like, the worst thing for me is like, once I finish the ball balls, I have to push up that ramp. I was about to say it's that. Like, <laughs> it's like, it, it could not be worse. I'm like, my arms are absolute toast at the end of it. Like they literally feel like they're going to crumble. And all I have to look at is this ramp that I have to get <laughs> on with like, like... often like spaz at the it's... end of it. And he's like, come on. <laughs> It Imagine like downhill. When... Like, I know. come on, <laughs> at least I know, like, right? sailing into glory, not pushing up. When you do get an adaptive <laughs> category, when that happens and when it will happen, like that is going to be the most exciting part. Like from yeah. the wall balls to the first person over up that ramp. I reckon yeah, it'll be like, literally. you know, like glad- gladiators with the travelator. Yes. I feel like it'll get <laughs> yeah. to the point where someone's arms have just gone and they haven't got it and someone's just going to come you flying past just them. Can't. <laughs> it no, will. literally it- it does it honestly feels like that at at points and I'm just like I don't know how I can get up this ramp (laughs) this ramp is actually five meters long it's like adrenaline you've done the whole thing and that ramp is going to take you out literally that ramp was the bane of my life at the end of the high rocks (laughs) hey high rocks take note note. (laughs) steadier one or an up and a down or something just anything to make it easier um okay before we go on to the cheeky insights um I I had a question just like myself anyway I was intrigued about like your recovery and your training because because of like being an adaptive athlete and I, I guess you're doing a lot like with your upper body like do you find that you are more likely to get like a repetitive strain injury or like you have to be careful with because you can't really split your training as in I know not everyone does split it into like leg day upper body day cardio day but yeah I I'm interested as to how you manage that um I think for me luckily I've never had any upper body injuries ironically um my coach is very careful at how how we program um so obviously for me every day is a really heavy arms day um (laughs) so it's it is I guess I I don't understand how my coach does it but he is just very clever at programming just enough to the point of fatigue without overstepping that barrier to potentially cause an injury so I think a lot of it has been trial and error of getting it right because I I train a lot like I often train like two to three hours a day so like I'm training a lot so it's it's trying to I I guess find that optimal level of doing enough without doing too much but I think as well like my upper body is a lot more resilient now as well because it's all I use so for everyday activities it's all my upper body so I think naturally you develop kind of like an excess level of strength Mm. that kind of like I I don't know the science behind this but I think it kind of adds like a protective layer in essence yeah um so yeah I yeah I push it without pushing it too much but how I do it I don't know and how I haven't had an upper body injury to this point is whether it or not it's luck or it is just very carefully planned um I don't know but yeah it, it is one of the battles that I think as an adaptive athlete you do have um and you do have to be very careful with like programming and training in general yeah yeah absolutely I just so like interesting as to how how you yeah go about it but I get you like you know your body as well so you you must maybe feel like some days more fatigued than others that maybe you know as well mentally right I need to like take a step back here and give myself a bit more recovery and not push too far but yeah and And I think that's one of the important things is actually like saying when your body does feel tired because I think athletes in general kind of have this like mindset where you're better just to push through it but actually for me like that isn't the case at all and if I do feel fatigued I tell my coach and we step it back a bit because 
it's not worth taking that gamble you know for me like taking that gamble could result in a nasty injury that potentially takes me out of an entire season of competition Mm -hmm. so yeah I think sometimes you just have to be kind to yourself and you just have to go with your own like intuition um rather than sometimes going with that like mindset where it's like you know what just put your head down and work hard and it'll all be okay um, yeah more isn't always better is it like play the long exactly game. and then so for other adaptive athletes that are listening to this what would be your like top three tips for like training for high rocks or getting to a high rock start line like how would you how do they start what what would you suggest they do um I think definitely the first one is just have like a really solid level of like general fitness anyway because I think high rocks is a long sport you know like Mm. like, it's over 60 minutes of work and I think no matter what level you're at 60 minutes plus is a lot so I think definitely have like a really solid like baseline fitness and that doesn't mean like you need to be excessively fit it just means that you can cope with doing sustained exercise Mm. um I think the second one is really learn how to pull a sled because for me this has been one of my hardest things like it doesn't feel a lot but you have to attach the weight onto your wheelchair so you're effectively pushing you or pulling you your wheelchair and a weighted sled which is a lot so like our division category for me my weight is set is like 55 kilos add my weight add my wheelchair weight we're talking like 120 130 kilos which is a lot to pull with only your arms so definitely train that movement like it's it's hard yeah yeah so I've actually started wearing gloves so like Mm. I've got a really thin pair of like highly rubberized gloves that I actually wear to push and to do all of that and I kind of get rid of them after that because you need like every little bit of grip that you can get no exactly you might you're just wasting energy if your hands are like slipping through eh? yeah and it's quite hard to do the sled push anyway because I I say it's a sled push it's not really a push it's effectively a pull because I'm pulling the weight Um, but it's like every movement or every rotation I do with my wheels, as soon as I sit back up to get that momentum to go again, you've kind of lost a few inches. So it's like you go forwards, back a bit, forwards, back a bit. So like, it's really demoralizing as well. So I think like that for me would probably be the biggest tip. Like do probably do not go into a high rocks without having practiced that sled pull movement because it, it is a really challenging movement and obviously it comes up second so it's like after mm. the ski erg and it's just absolutely brutal um did you manage yeah, that... to practice it before did you manage to practice it before yeah and I'm guessing yeah, if so... people went to like a high rocks affiliated gym or maybe a crossfit gym with a sled like they would be able to help them adapt it for like can they get a yeah, you... handbook I'm guessing the same way as you did so people can see how to do it yeah, so you would just have to email High Rocks to ask for the handbook. But effectively, the best way to try it, you you have to find a way to rig the chair to the to the sled, and that's your responsibility. So High Rocks takes no responsibility for that. You have to come with the correct equipment in order to hook it all up. Um, so I think once you've found like the best way to hook it up for you is Mm. stick with that and just keep training it and training it and training it because as much as it sucks like repetition is the only way that you can get good at it and even Mm. for me like I'm not good at it I'm solid at it I like I, I cannot move that sled fast but for me it's it's not about moving it fast it's about I guess moving it consistently yeah keep um, going keep going yeah yeah and I mean like you'll see from my heroic signs like I will always be in like the bottom sixth when it comes to the sled push just because of the nature of it for mm. us and it is hard and I think <clears throat> you know like this I'm better off being honest with people and being like you really kind of struggle with it because it yeah, is absolutely practice. horrendous yeah, yeah yeah that's what but people like, want to know though isn't it that's, yeah. that's exactly what people want to know 
yeah so just work really hard at that um I think honestly like I can only really give two because they're probably the two biggest ones like just general fitness and working hard on that sled and even the sled pull like working on the movement of pulling the sled and like finding whether or not you're best at you know just gripping it once and pulling it back or you're doing an under over under over under over um you know like the thing is for high rocks like for everybody it's all about trial and error at those stations and working out what works best for you because what works best for me might not work best for the next person so I think it's like having the confidence of going into it of knowing that you know it works for me and I know what I need to do to make it work for me um so yeah just work hard basically yeah, that, just I mean, work that, really that's hard that's a good one though yeah I that's think, a like, good one for, for everyone isn't it yeah you don't have to compare like yourself directly to the next person I think yeah for adaptive and um other athletes like at different techniques different body types different makeups like work better for different people and people have different strengths in different areas so like it, it it's not a one rule fits all is it I guess no and I think like that is the important thing because when you are on that high rocks course it's very easy to like look out of the corner of your eye and see what someone else is doing and suddenly notice that they're doing it wildly differently to you and you just have this like compulsion to want to copy them but actually like that isn't the best thing to do like just stick to your own plan like just have a clear plan imagine you've got blinkers on you can't see anybody else and just do your own thing because at the end of the day with high rocks you're racing yourself yeah Yeah. so just yeah head down blinkers on and and just go through the motions of, of knowing what works best for you yeah I love that okay shall we go on to the cheeky insights we have eight questions for you. Um, so first one I'm going to ask is, I'm going to make it two. It's what shoes do you wear when you're racing high rocks? But I'm also going to ask, do you use a different wheelchair? Okay, so in terms of wheelchair, no, I don't use a different wheelchair okay. at the moment, but I would like to. But okay. wheelchairs are astronomically expensive. I was so... going to say, it's not an easy thing to just yeah go out no uh, yeah, I mean like yeah. wheelchairs range from like 6k up to about 12k depending on what you need so like they're very expensive I would like to get one specifically for like high rocks and crossfit just because it puts a lot of strain on my day chair and obviously I rely on that every single day yeah um yeah. so yeah I I would like to get another one but don't at the moment and in terms of shoes I wear pumas so I think like most uh-huh. people, I'm I am, yeah, I am a Puma fan. So yeah, I'm currently Puma racing camp. in Pumas. I am, <laughs> yes, very much in the Puma camp. Love it. <laughs> okay, next one is which was your favourite High Rocks venue that you've raced in so far? Oh, this is a really hard one because I've enjoyed all of them for different reasons. But I think it has to be London because it was my first one. The environment was incredible. And like I've said, like, I've got memories from there that I will never forget. But yeah. in saying that, like I've enjoyed all of them equally. Um, and even like the European champs, which I thought would be beyond hectic, actually was just as enjoyable. So yeah, I've loved them all, but London has a very special place in my heart. So I yeah. mean, it made me like think, bloody hell, that sounds so cool. Like when you were just talk- describing it. I could just imagine the crowd and like we we um interviewed to see uh, Celia the badass grand and she was saying like a similar thing how she like stood up after what one of her races and people were like like go on Celia on the on the yeah. pole. and then she stood up and like bowed <laughs> she, before yeah. she left because she was like I felt like I needed to say like thank you to them because it was so amazing and I was like oh that's the that's just like the buzz of that I just don't see how you could ever honestly like that you. that's kind of like my feeling and it's like you want to say thank you to everybody but yeah you're often so you're gassed passing, at that point where you do. just can't yeah. and it's yeah. like, like <laughs> I'm like my my head is ticking and I'm like my time in the rock zone is going up so I just need <laughs> yeah. to get moving <laughs> I need to get out of here come on yeah. and um, I'm gonna sneak a question in here what your next high rocks race that you've got planned is London again is it yeah London Olympia this time so yeah, okay. yeah I think 
I think the venue is slightly smaller, so it might be a little bit trickier for me. But everyone says it's amazing because they have the balcony up at the top. The, the top, yeah, so, that's yeah. where we, that's where we, we raced. raced. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it was really cool because it had like people overlooking. So I, yeah. I liked it as a venue, yeah. Everyone says it's amazing. So I'm hoping that it will be really, really nice because it kind of falls at quite a nice time because it's like post London Marathon, and there's not a huge amount of CrossFit that will happen between that. It will kind of more just be the training towards semi-finals. So yeah, it will all work. It will just be really nice. I think. I think it fits really well into the calendar. So. And oh, how's the sorry. training going for the London Marathon? Is that like miles upon miles upon miles? Or are well, you... do, you, do you know what you say that? And I feel like that's what I should be doing. But actually, like, I haven't really done much more than 10K because I think I just get to the point where I'm like, I push every single day. Yeah, and it's no fair. different to like, it is mm. not like running where you, you're not doing it every day. So you like need to build up that like increment slowly. For me, it's like, I push my wheelchair every day. So I don't know how I can train differently to what I do in a day-to-day yeah. life. Yeah. So That's I'm like, if I needed to point. push for 26 miles in a day, I would, would. push for 26 yeah. miles yeah. in a day. Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't really know how to train for it. So the, the best answer is no, I probably haven't really been training for it. <laughs> but but I, in saying that, I feel like all of like my CrossFit training and all my high rocks training yeah. kind of fits in really well to that. So yeah it's like a lot of cross training I think so it will all cross over really really well um at one point or another so yeah I'm not worried about the fact that I haven't racked up a huge amount of mileage at this point um (laughs) pretty sure I can do it I hope so hopefully I'm not gonna eat my words but you've got the strength as well haven't you and I guess it it will probably be like the the fatigue like the muscle fatigue whereas like you've trained that so much that that's probably a huge advantage that yeah, some wheelchair athletes just that just you know are just endurance athletes would not have trained that like muscular um endurance that you, you're gonna have um exactly so have yeah i'm hoping the ramp. yeah there's no ramp to that's finish, true <laughs> no there's no ramp like it's a nice flat like long <laughs> slog go. along the mouth so i feel like it's set up perfectly for me just get just have that in your mind be like it's yeah. okay it's not high rocks there's no ramp yeah, no ramp and no warbles. No warbles, I was going to say. <laughs> Although Where'd I'll say mean? that and there'll be somebody probably at the end of the course sat there with a warble <laughs> waiting for me to cross the line to like... <laughs> if we're in London that day, I am so going to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, that leads me on nicely to the, what is your favourite high rock station? And I'm guessing it's not warbles. No, definitely not warbles. Um, I think my, my favourite would be definitely have to be the row I just I love rowing I don't know why I just feel like it sits at a really good point in the competition where I can just like get onto it move solidly but move quickly and it kind of like is one of the only movements where I can breathe properly because I'm like actually upright whereas with a lot of the other movements I'm hunched over like the skier I'm hunched over for both of the sled movements I'm hunched um so like it it comes at a nice point where like I actually can just sit up take a deep breath relax with every stroke but just pull hard um so I kind of use it as a bit of a recovery station in the sense that I'm breathing well um but I'm still working hard so yeah I think it's a favorite for the for that reason but also I'm quite strong on a rowing machine so yeah it's just a nice one to feel like confident at yeah and nice to have it at that point in the race as well when yeah it's like that nice like halfway point give or take I think that's where a lot of people like the row don't they because yeah that like halfway point you've got you can just get in the the zone a little bit as well can't you You just kind of like yeah and And hope um... they've got some like really good music going that you can just like sing along to in your head or like for (laughs) me I have Jake often yeah, behind me or in front of me. <laughs> yeah, literally, either he's singing in front of me or dancing in front of me, or like he's doing something to keep me entertained. So it often makes like the road go faster as well. So like I honestly like I'm very lucky that I have someone like Jake in my camp because 
you know like I often do have that like mental benefit as well for the fact that I have someone on the course with me to like help steady my chair and things but he can often bark stuff at me so when I'm like not doing well <laughs> he's there to like offer that encouragement or when like things are going great like I get like really nice comments from him and yeah he just does stuff to to cheer me up and <laughs> make things go a little bit faster I mean like That's, he does yeah. he does some funny things doesn't he so yeah he's a, he's a very good person to have in my camp, camp. <laughs> yeah. exactly every everyone needs a joke <laughs> could you um so just while we're on the row um we we did a um podcast with the erg army and their big thing was about damper settings what do you what do you set your damper to you get one chance to adjust it what do you do it on the ski and the on the row do you change it um, or six no six, six for, both. for both of them yeah because i i think like that i've worked out is like optimal i feel like any higher than that and like the fatigue sets in a little bit faster um and actually you know like it might go slightly faster for like the first segment but as soon as that fatigue sets in yeah, you're kind yeah. of you're you're treading water um whereas I feel like six is is steady enough you can pull it like a really decent like cadence without it feeling like I'm going to end Rinsing up in shit's creek yeah <laughs> yeah totally. especially when then you've got to go out and you're using your arms instead of your legs on the road exactly you no know, you need to I just wondered if you did anything slightly different just because you knew you no were, it was like to be to fair arms, like I I try not to change it anyway because normally they're set on like five or yeah. six so normally like I try not to faff about because as soon get as I in come it. into that station I just want to get the handles of the ski erg or the row and just get going because yeah, you yeah. can easily lose like 20 seconds by faffing mm. and when you're like going like for a really good time or for a position like often those 20 seconds can be the difference between being on the podium or off the podium so yeah, yeah sometimes even, like, it's just easier to get own, going yeah someone being their PB. Own PB. like you're right yeah. if, they, if someone might go into that next station and stop faffing if they've got that in their head that you've just said they could save 20 seconds that could be 20 yeah. seconds that they beat their own pb at honestly for me it's not worth it and like, I've seen people whack the dampener up to like eight nine ten and I'm like I don't know what on earth these people are doing but to <laughs> me know. like that does not feel optimal for yeah. an event of like a 60 minute plus race yeah um yeah. hats off to them if they can sustain that like I think it's hugely impressive but that is just not for me no agreed no, agreed <laughs> Um, okay, next one is if you could do a doubles high rocks with anyone in the world, who would it be? Jake. So I'm <laughs> actually doing one with Jake um, in Birmingham. Oh, cool. This year. Yeah. So we are doing mixed Birmingham. doubles. Um, he, I think he did mention. I think, he, I think he's going to need some training, isn't he? Yeah, he's going to need <laughs> some training. But I think, like, I, I can't think of anybody else I'd want to do it with because Jake has kind of been my biggest support through my high rocks journey so it only seems fair that I do it with him um that's awesome because yeah like he he is honestly probably my biggest supporter in high rocks um and it's really incredible to have someone like that in your in your field so yeah I think it's going to be really awesome and I I like I have said to Jake I'm like it's really gonna humble you because yeah I think like, I think it might yeah because he's so yeah. good at running like he's such a good runner exactly. but you're gonna take the running away from him and then exactly. he's gonna have to go in a chair exactly Are so you, like, you're gonna have to be his hype girl this time I am <laughs> I am but do you know what like I I think even the fact that Jake is willing to put himself in a position that is like very outside of his comfort zone and you like it is a massive challenge I think just shows the sort of person that he is and I think yeah, that's sure. another reason for wanting to do it with Jake because he is so passionate about making sport inclusive mm. on every single level so I, I think the fact that he is willing to do that and is willing to you know compromise potentially his own schedule his own plan for the season I, I, I think is hugely admirable so yeah, I'm really excited to see how it goes, but uh, I, I think he's gonna love it. I think he's gonna like walk away from it and be like, "That was really hard, but I absolutely, absolutely loved, it. loved it." Like that's I'm what so I want him to say at the end of it. So, I'm so excited to see. I can't wait. 
I know, yeah. and you're gonna have to go for another podium because you've got to be that annoying person that High Rock's like, oh, here we go again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <That's two of laughs> them. Exactly, you know, there's two of us. Um, <laughs> but like, but I think the other reason for us doing it together is like just to show people Agreed. and just to, uh, I think, not prove to people how difficult it is to do it with a disability because I think people understand that anyway. But it's just to show that you know sometimes if you like step outside of your comfort zone and you try something new, you le- you learn a lot from it. Mm. And I think like, this is what's going to happen for Jade. Like it's going to be a learning experience and it will be an experience that he can then talk about. So I think like sometimes it's, it's nice for people to put themselves in, you know, what are naturally quite uncompromising positions um, just to learn and just to be able to actually talk about it and advocate for us because there is nothing wrong with able-bodied athletes advocating for adaptive athletes in sport I think sometimes people need to understand it better but what is a better way to understand it than to actually immerse yourself in it and doing what exactly just what Jake is doing so I would actually love everybody at High Rocks everyone that works for High Rocks to get in a wheelchair or to do it as an adaptive athlete, like to do it potentially as a as a blind athlete and do it with like your your eyes covered yeah. or you know, like there are with so many different yeah. ways. Exactly. Just to try things and and learn from it. Cause yeah, I think there's there's a lot of scope for, for things to change. No, brilliant. I think that's yeah. I, I'm looking forward to that. I think it'll be it'll be a cool journey. You'll have to document the the whole like your training and everything together because yeah a hundred percent I think I think interesting we will as, yeah as doing the actual race I think to be fair all of the bloopers are going to be pretty good <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll be the best bit won't it? <laughs> I can't wait I'm excited already um okay next up is about fueling do you take on any fuel during high rocks no I think for me it's it's not necessarily long enough to fuel during a race and I think if you fuel well enough beforehand you don't necessarily need to fuel during it I mean like I won't even take on water or Red Bull during the race because again you're talking seconds yeah um so yeah I just fuel well beforehand and I have like a very (laughs) very clear set of things that I do before a race and if I don't do it I feel like things never go to plan so (laughs) I've like often had this situation when I've competed abroad where I've like had to take my own things just so yeah. I can like stick to my schedule and stick to like what I'm used to doing. Um, What's your go-to pre-race food? Do you have like a? Um, so I'll often have like a big bowl of porridge in the morning, um, quite early, probably four to six hours before I race. So it's a bit trickier in the morning if I haven't if I have a morning race yeah um but yeah I'll have a big bowl of porridge with lots of fresh fruit um and then a couple of hours before I race I always have four crumpets with marmalade on um I like that one I could get on board with that yeah I am a yeah crumpets and marmalade type of girl because I I don't know weirdly they they're quite light and they digest Mm -hmm. quite quickly but they give you that nice sustained like carb benefit um and as well like you keep the taste of the marmalade in your mouth for the race so I always feel like if I need like that sugar boost like I've already got it in my gums like it's kind of already there <laughs> I like um, that. yeah because I feel like marmalade is one of those things where it like just hangs about for a while so I feel like I, <laughs> I don't know it's stuff there it's like um, you're going <laughs> yeah yeah but honestly like trying to find crumpets abroad is really difficult like oh, really yeah, really hard totally. Like it's possible, yeah. but like it is a challenge. So you need to travel with them for sure. We yeah, just went out yeah. to go see my sister, didn't we, in Dubai, and we took her out a load of crumpets. <laughs> she was no, like, "I just want honestly, crumpets. like crumpets are my thing. Like I have them basically every day before every workout. Like not as many. Like I'll often have just like one before <laughs> a workout, but they're like my non-negotiable. Like that and Humantra. Like I kind yeah. cannot live without." get this girl of warburton sponsorship yeah. like <laughs> yeah. where are they <laughs> i feel like i'm gonna want to have a cup of tea and a crumpet after oh, this no. <laughs> <laughs> um okay next one is what's your favorite training session for high rocks i've got a feeling it might be some sort of conditioning 
<laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely conditioning. Um, any long like row or ski piece that is segmented by like sled pull, sled pushes, um, would perhaps be an ideal. Sometimes I get them where I have to do the sandbag workout, but I don't particularly like the sandbag just because it's quite a slow movement because I I can only move as fast as what the sandbag will move in. I can turn around on the sandbag. Um, but yeah, any... That, that's, that's instead of the... Lun- that's the lunges. The yeah, so instead of lunges, we basically use the same weight sandbag, but instead of it obviously being behind our head and doing a lunge, we have to put it on the floor, lift it over, and then you turn around the sandbag and then same again. So it's a lot of like repetitive, like up, down, up, down, turn around yeah. type movements. Um, so it, it's hard because it's trying to find that like power speed ratio, um, yeah, yeah. which can be really hard because it's one of the last movements. So often like your grip is kind of gone at that point yeah. and the power is not necessarily as good as it would have been at the start. So yeah. that that can be quite a long slog um, and it does go on for a while. Um, and it's oh, just yeah. really demoralizing seeing people doing lunges moving past you. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Like... Often it, like there are things that I really wish I could do in high rocks, um, like lunges, weirdly like burpee broad jumps because our alternative for a burpee broad jump is a wheelie at some races it will be the entire length and it won't be segmented so like trying to do is it is 100 feet isn't it i'm pretty sure it's i'm pretty sure it's 100 foot but trying to do that as a wheelie like unbroken when your grip and your forearms are on fire is honestly horrific so sometimes I wish like I had like that lower body functionality <laughs> so I can actually give my arms a little bit of a break for once. yeah it's so much um, like grip and that's quite oh, skillful as well so... wheelie like that's yeah, like it's... not messing around that's like yeah, doing burpees no. isn't really skillful like you throw yourself on the floor you get back up and then you yeah. jump but actually having to hold a wheelie is a pretty like that's quite technical is it yeah yeah it's a very technical movement and especially like under fatigue as well because like once your grip is gone trying to hold that wheelie position is just like unsustainable like I don't think I felt pain like it like I did in London like I my forearms were like quivering to the point where like I just could not grip so yeah it's it is really really challenging sometimes but it's one of those movements where it's like if you can sustain it enough to just have enough like grip strength to do it you can get it done quite quickly but yeah and you it's just also quite it's yeah but it's also quite high risk as well because like you can tip up quite easily or if you put down your front cast as you then have to go back like 10 meters or 15 meters so you end up like losing quite a lot of time sometimes so it's probably the most like risk averse movement and I don't like doing it because either I gain time or I lose a lot of time yeah it, and it's almost like oh, it's a bit hit and miss isn't it? you you could just accidentally like just slightly move in the wrong way or let the grip go a tiny bit and then that's you like done yeah like, that's it exactly like it's yeah. Is it the yeah, same as it, like I used to do a lot of mountain biking and wheelies is obviously a big thing in mountain biking. But if you if you go too far, you're out the back. Yeah, and if exactly. you go too forward, you come down. So like to exactly. find that bit, like I can only like, but like to do that is like, oh man, it is even when you're not fatigued, it's hard to find that right that exact balance point and hold that balance point. Yeah, it's hard. It is. Yeah, I feel it like is really, really difficult. And it's 80 metres, like, I just double-checked. Yeah, meters. so, like, it's it's quite a long way when you are yeah. under fatigue. <laughs> so, and, and, like, some races that I've done, it's been, like, 80 metres in one go, and you just look at the end of it, and you can just see it coming oh. for miles and miles and miles, and mm-hmm. it's, like, that's a long way to sustain what very little grip I actually have left. Oh, man. Um, you know what you need right. to do now, though? You just need to wheelie down the mall at the end of the uh, the London Marathon, because that will be like, yeah. exactly <laughs> the same, won't it? Everyone will be like, check this girl out. <laughs> yeah, like, literally. Under all I of was going to say, like, 
anyone moaning about therapy broad jumps i don't know what you're moaning about like <laughs> i should give everyone the alternative if you moan jump in that chair and then see if you can hold a wheelie and if you can't get back to the beginning <laughs> yeah yeah no honestly I would... like I, I would love to see like more people doing high rocks just like try like odd stations and i've said the yeah. same for crossfit like how amazing would it be to go to a crossfit box and have like a whole heap of wheelchairs and just get everybody in a wheelchair and just run an entire crossfit class oh but yeah everybody sees it i just think that would be incredible like i, think I it's a, and people I do need that. humbling like but you do need to like see like from other people's point of view because until you're there you don't know and exactly. like I, the only thing i can relate it to is when i was at uni we did a like a module and it was on adaptive like a sport and we had the 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 guy off the BBC that has the dreadlocks, the black guy. I can't remember oh, his yeah. He's in a wheelchair. Just like a crazy sound? stuff. Yes. He just like mental stuff on a wheelchair. But he came and we did wheelchair basketball. And I was like, I am all over this because I did a bit of riding and I was like, I'll be cool. And like, I was fine until I got to the net. And then I, when I tried to throw it, I was like, obviously, I use my legs a lot. And this is like how I can relate to your wall balls. But like, I just couldn't get it anywhere near the net. I like did not have the strength, upper body strength, to just throw that ball. Like I obviously always jumped, and I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> like, yeah, totally now took what? me by yeah. surprise. Yeah, because I just I was like, I just need to get stronger. I was like, I'm so weak. Yeah, but- it definitely is humbling for sure. And like I found this like when I first got in a wheelchair and first tried to do sport, I was like, "This is really really difficult." And I don't think you realise it, like watching things like the Paralympics, like you're just like, oh my God, they make it look so easy. Because they're the but best like, in the world. They're exactly. Like, yeah. You don't realise like how much time and effort goes into making it look so effortless. Mm. And like, it does take a lot of time and a lot of practice and a lot of failure. Like, don't get me wrong, like to master wheelies for me, like I have fought out countless times. Mm. Um but yeah, it, it definitely, definitely would be a humbling experience. But I'm a big, I'm a big advocate for people stepping outside of their comfort zones and, and trying things that don't necessarily impact them, but impact others in society. And I always think we should like have a, a rounded knowledge of, of like how things are different for people. And I think the only way to appreciate that is to actually try it sometimes. Yeah, just put yeah. yourself in their shoes. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I'm never gonna look at Burpee broad jumps the same. Like, <laughs> that's changed <laughs> my perspective. If I'm doing one in a high rocks and I'm moaning, I'm like, I should be grateful that I'm doing this. So, um, okay. Next up is I've lost my word. That was favorite training session. We just went off on a little bit of a tangent. And um, why should someone sign up for their first high rocks as an adaptive athlete? Why would you say to someone, give it a go? I think it's honestly just one of the best ways to like push you outside of your comfort zone and just try something different because a lot of the movements are like not necessarily movements that you would do in like your day-to-day life. So it's a way to test like other skills. It's a way to push those boundaries. It's just also a way to like learn, I guess, a little bit more about like what your capabilities are and like where you can go from here. But aside from that, like just get there and experience that environment because for me, like the environment will like outweigh anything else that like anyone will have ever experienced before. And I think like that for me is my biggest driving factor for keep for like keeping going back and doing more and more and more and more and more because of that environment. Now, if that environment didn't exist, would I still go back and do high rocks? Probably just because I love the competition element. (laughs) But I think like like, conditioning session. (laughs) Exactly. It's like a conditioning (laughs) session. But honestly like for any adaptive athlete out there just sign up go there just enjoy it and just honestly like take a breath and just take in all of that like love and support that you will get because I I cannot explain like how overwhelmed they will be with the adulation that they will get from other people being there and it's not just people watching it's people on the course like you'll be pushing around in your chair and people will be like oh my god go on girl like (laughs) it's just like it's constant and it comes from everybody and it's just it's the biggest confidence boost that you can get 
as an adaptive athlete so I highly recommend like honestly I mean, if I could get every adaptive athlete in London onto the start of a high rocks I would facilitate that 100% because it is something that everybody should experience at least once in their life if you haven't sold that to someone like if this podcast hasn't sold it to someone to to go and do that I don't, I don't know what has really to be honest yeah like I agree it's so inspirational yeah and last question for you is is there anyone that you would like us to ask uh, that you would like to see on the podcast that you would like to know a little bit more about oh oh that's a hard here, one haven't I? yeah <laughs> there's, a, there's a really lovely lady who I met in London called Tor I don't know if you'll know about her but she's currently I I don't want to get this wrong so I'm sorry Tor if I get this wrong but um is battling stage four breast cancer and she did her first high rocks in London and she is one of the most inspirational individuals I've ever met in my life and I would love to do doubles with her at some point but she just she breaks down every barrier that exists and she is just the most beautiful human being and I think like what she has achieved like outweighs everything that I've achieved like she is honestly the most incredible person and you would have the most incredible chat with her like she is honestly phenomenal amazing I did I did see something about her actually after London I definitely saw something shared on her and looked her up so I I know who you're talking about She, she got like blonde hair yeah she's got blonde hair yeah, yeah I think I think we're talking about the same person okay but we'll, yeah she we'll honestly she's incredible yeah, that sounds amazing that but that's very amazing. kind because I think like you are an inspiration and I do like as much as you maybe don't think as but I know people find it hard themselves like believing that they are but I think like you really should believe in yourself and you are an incredible human being and you are doing so much for adapt with that adaptive athletes other athletes high rocks like inspiring so many people and I I do think like the your mindset is incredible how you have like carried on and pushed through Mm -hmm. and you're still smashing crossfit high rocks pushing boundaries like even with a, a mini injury you still have the like foresight and the want and the drive to keep going so I think like hats off to you thank you so Charlotte where can everyone find you where where can everyone follow the story like follow your story where can everyone watch all your competitions how can people get in touch if they're an adaptive athlete to to find out more so I am not the best person for using social media but um (laughs) I use Instagram primarily um so yeah feel free to drop me a message on Instagram I will always try and respond and if I can't help I will always direct you to the right people who can help you um especially from like an adaptive perspective um and yeah I'm just always there I'll always try and give like advice as well so if anyone's struggling with any of the movement standards like yeah just hit me up like I will always always do what I can try and do to facilitate more adaptive athletes in the high rocks and crossfit space so yeah if I can help just yeah. your tag is at charlotte underscore r burnett yeah that right correct yeah, yeah we'll put it we'll put it in the show notes so people can, can um click on it anyway and it'll be on our instagram when we, when we release this um episode we'll make sure people can find you amazing yeah and then, just before we finish red bull 400 what, what's that That's so the red bull 400 is basically a race that is held on a ski slope or not oh, necessarily gosh. ski slope but like Actually. a ski so you know where they do like a ski jump yeah and they kind of like look like Eddie the Eagle um like that basically they do a race from the ground 400 meters up to the top of it and last year a adaptive athlete called Millie Pickles did it last year she is a amputee and I saw her do it last year and I was in awe of what she did and I saw her and I was like you know what I've got to try this so oh I believe that I will be the first person in a wheelchair to do it now I won't actually be doing it in a wheelchair because there is no way that I can push a wheelchair on a basically vertical slope 
So I will be doing it by basically dragging myself up on my bottom the entire way. Um, so yeah, I am. Um, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. In fact, it's probably going to be the hardest thing that I do this year because it is well, almost a near vertical um, when's that? time. I think it's September. Oh my god! I, I've got and a then, very long calendar year. You are you're gonna be busy. I, know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm busy. Racing. Like that is unreal. You know, when yeah. someone says something's hard, you should train it more. And Charlotte's like, oh, you know that ramp at the end of High Rock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and go. Yeah, and to exactly. The <laughs> and then that ramp will seem like nothing. <laughs> yeah, that ramp will seem like basically a flat <laughs> or a like one percent incline rather than it feeling like a hundred percent incline at the moment <laughs> oh my god it sounds horrific however you get up it sounds horrific <laughs> anyway like yeah. just a vertical fo- 400 meters is it or 400 yeah. yeah sugar I think for me though wow. like the thing is I'm like I I always want to challenge myself so I will always find probably the most extreme versions of things to do because I think that is the best way to like push yourself and you know I don't know just like test that human nature that I think is built within us but we often don't use so I just really want to see what I am truly capable of doing and seeing how far I can push those barriers before they become like too much of a barrier um so yeah it's, it's something different it's not something that I've like ever really done or saying that it's something that I can't really train for again it's a bit like the marathon I, I yeah. can't really train for it so it's just going to be a case that we're just going to hope for the best get in and um, grind yeah but yeah I, I think it will be amazing so yeah if anybody has any other challenges <laughs> that they can well, suggest yeah. <laughs> please let me know do you um, have a free weekend always... between now and 2027 or... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but it. yeah like I'm always looking for for something different to try and yeah just prove to people that it is possible because I think society is very very quick to knock you down rather than build you up so I am that person trying to build people up to prove that it is possible rather than the the other side of that so yeah we'll try everything we can until there comes a point where it's just not possible anymore oh, oh. man I mean Oh, yeah, incredible. And then if that's not a reason to follow your story to see what you're going to do next and how everything goes, I don't really know what is, to be honest. And maybe we'll have to do another podcast episode, like post London Marathon, your next um, High Rocks and the Red Bull 400, just to see how you get on. I think like I think we need to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 100%. Um, 100%. But amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. I I really appreciate it. I know Em does as well. Um. I think you've done a lot for everybody, not just adaptive athletes, but I think all athletes just to look at even mindset of when they go into the next high rocks or even just to challenge themselves and looking at what you might be able to do and push your own barriers. Um, I think the biggest takeaway for me probably is just the fact that you made that first call to go into the CrossFit gym um, and to actually just keep going back and yeah, just take that step that some people find so hard. So hopefully the takeaway is that people will just go, go and take that first step. Um, yeah. So hopefully, yeah, follow the show, share this episode far and wide. Um, if you want to do an adaptive uh, race at High Rocks, then get in there and, and support Charlotte and let's get more people there, more people on the podiums and let's see that part of High Rocks grow, hopefully. Um, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs>